It's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker of the day, uh, Morgan Quigley. This is far and away my favorite picture of Morgan. Uh, and, you know, if he's embarrassed by it, he shouldn't have put it on his webpage. So, uh, I don't know how many of you know Morgan. Uh, he's, uh, he's a uh, grad student at Stanford and goes way back in Ross. I think it's fair to say that he's the, really the grandfather, godfather of Ross. Uh, and he's going to tell you uh, a story about the history of Ross, how it got started, where it is now, and some ideas for where it's going to go. But I thought I'd give you a little context for Morgan. So I went back into the uh, uh, track revision logs and um, just pulled up some things from, you know, four years ago. So these are some commit messages from Morgan. I like coding, coding, coding. Um, you know, Morgan likes Ruby, and he was, I think, really disappointed that we never managed to make any of the core components in ROS in Ruby. I think he would have been much happier if we'd done that. Um, and if you've, if, you've, if you've done anything with ROS, you've used Morgan's code. ROS EPP, ROS Pack, all those core tools from way back. Morgan wrote all that stuff. And if you've ever seen any of those tools respond with hooray, that's Morgan. Uh, that's in the code, that's in the comments, that's talking to you on the console. So, with that, uh, Morgan Quigley. Okay, Brian, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for setting up this fantastic meeting. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Morgan Quigley, like Brian said. Um, I have less hair now than in that last picture, unfortunately. I suppose that's the, uh, the way things tend to go. So, let's see. I'm gonna talk about Ross past, present, future. Um, I'm still in school. Hopefully not for too much longer, but I'm still in school. Uh, this is joint work with tons of people, as you can imagine, on a large group project like this. Uh, at Stanford, Willow Garage, institutions around the world. Um, I listed some of the names of kind of the early days contributors of ROS, but obviously the community has exploded since then, and um, we would love to put all the thousands of names of contributors on here, but that'd be a big slide and to be squinting. So let's just go with those. Um, the last is my advisor, Andrew Ng, at Stanford. Okay, so to outline, first I'll talk, uh, just kind of a general overview of what is going on with ROS, um, then talk about the past, kind of the early days, where we came from. Hopefully that will serve a little bit to explain some of the kind of assumptions or things that are built into ROS. Talk about the present, where we're now, uh, what's going on with ROS, what cool stuff is happening, and then I'll turn Crackpot a little bit and talk about some random ideas for the future, uh, which will be fun. Okay, so first of all, why is robot software important? I think a lot of us in this room already kind of get this, but um, I think it's still important just to briefly overview. Robot hardware, <laughs> is currently more capable than, than robot software. Um, if you look at teleoperated robot systems, they can do pretty amazing things. At uh, those pictures on the bottom there, we did a demo for the DARPA ARMH program that I'm in. We're all making low-cost robot hands, and then we can run them on these. Um, DARPA has a platform with two Barrett WAMs on them. So we can have like a data glove and a master-slave system, and, and you can just do ridiculous things quite easily. Uh, right there, I was picking up a power drill with the data glove and a master-slave running the Barrett. Um, you know, turning the drill on and off, turning flashlights on and off, we're then putting batteries into flashlights and screwing it shut, um, picking up all sorts of tools, finger gating them up and in the grasp, things that are just easy to do for people um, and easy to do if you have a high bandwidth teleoperated system with low latency, uh, very difficult to do with software. So I think that's good. Um, that's not an insult at all, it's exciting. It's an exciting time, part, an exciting time to be in the field. Um, but even with teleoperation, even if we did happen to have, um, you know, teleoperated systems that can run all the robots in the world, a lot of the applications that we look to as roboticists are going to be tough to do without, uh, with unassisted teleoperation. So it's unlikely, I think, if we want to do elder care, for example, that we're going to have a gigabit Ethernet pipe to every, every home in the world. Uh, maybe someday, but it's not uh, imminent, at least, shall we say. So we have communications latency problems, throughput problems, and then, of course, it's nice to be able to understand the environment enough to be intelligent and, and not um, you know, hurt people, hurt robots, <clears throat> crash into things in the environment. To do all, do all that requires some reasoning and some knowledge and understanding about what's going on in the world around you, which means lots of software. Now next, why is it hard? Um, it's hard, I think, because it's a huge problem and that the expertise required to make these things work and to build more systems is distributed among tons and tons of people across the world. To, do, to get all those things to work together implies mass integration of everyone's work, tying lots of systems together, tying lots of knowledge bases together, lots of um, cultural issues as well as technical issues there. And at the same time, we're trying to integrate all these class of things, we have to keep them running fast because it's a robot. So we don't want to just sit there and wait um, for you know, minutes on end while we think about what to do next. It just looks bad on videos. Okay. 
So then what, is, what does ROS do? So it's several things at once. Uh, the term ROS, I guess, can become kind of overloaded. When you say, oh, I'm using ROS, it's like, well, what are you actually using? There's, at its core, a messaging layer. There's a, it sends messages from programs to other programs. Can, uh, I think, though, also, what's perhaps even more valuable is a set of integration conventions. So over time, uh, we just, as a community, have started to do things kind of a certain way. There's a certain message that encapsulates laser scans. Um, let's see. There's also useful common tools, like, tools um, to log data, tools to show things on the screen, those are also valuable. And sometimes when we say we're using ROS, really that's what we mean is we're using these visualization tools or these particular data streaming tools. There's also a, implementations of algorithms that we read about in papers that are now vetted and in code. Um, I would hope that we don't need, if we're doing 2D SLAM, for example, we can just use the grid fast SLAM that's, that's in ROS now. We don't have to code it up again because there's a vetted implementation now that has been tested with robots all across the world. We can just use it. We don't have to work on it again. But most importantly, there's an active community. There's us, there's our friends on the email list who weren't, aren't here today. There's people coming through the pipeline. Um, there's those of us who, who work in this domain who then can help each other out. Next, uh, equally importantly, what does ROS not do? We worked hard to enforce, uh, to have it not, rather, enforce structure on your program's code or data. That's a great thing, or that's a terrible thing, depending on who you ask, um, depending on whether people like to work in formal environments or informal environments. Uh, the idea we wanted to have is that that's optional. And so you can kind of put your own structure there if you like lots of structure, or you can just be kind of wild and crazy if you're like me and have a hard time thinking about the same thing for more than 30 seconds. Um, security is not in ROS. Uh, we're not security people. We're aware of that. I, we figured that it was better to actually not do security and say, oh, you should use a VPN or whatever, rather than to pretend to do security and do it wrong. Um, we don't operate in hard real time very well. That's hard to do, um, as I'm sure there are lots of people here who are experts in hard real time. To, to do that well requires a lot of structure, metadata, and careful planning um, for the framework. There are others out there in the world, Orokos and Rock or two, that, uh, that do that very well. And we tend to just say, oh, for hard real time, we bridge to Orokos and, and it's awesome. Okay, so that's kind of a brief uh, drive-by overview. I'll next talk about kind of early days of ROS, where we came from, um, which hopefully will help to explain some assumptions and, and ways of doing things in the system. So it kind of, uh, at least from my perspective, I started work on this stuff with the STAIR project, or Stanford AI Robot. This was a big interdisciplinary project at Stanford, started in 2005, about the same, same time I got to Stanford. Uh, what we wanted to do in that project was to integrate lots of state-of-the-art research onto the same platform. So oftentimes what happens in, in robotics and in other fields as well is everyone kind of works on their own piece of a large problem and then they sort of you know, stay in their own silo, I guess. What we wanted to do instead was to force everybody, no matter how much grumbling occurs, to, to crush all these sub-projects onto the same robot. And the idea was that we would learn things in the process that we wouldn't learn if we were just, for example, only doing computer vision with a camera on our desk, or if we were only doing grasping with a, with a robot that wasn't sensing at the same time, or, or whatever. Um, the idea was that there would be um, coupling between these projects that would be interesting and lead to, to new insights. Uh, for scale, we had, I, I went actually through the list a couple of days ago, and I found the names of about 100 people over the years, several course projects um, working on this thing, so that means you have the excitement of kind of there's a deadline at the end of the quarter, let's, let's go crazy. Um, parallel research threads and all those subdomains on the previous page, um, but then two platforms that were constantly evolving. Those pictures were taken at one point in time, um, usually every, every month the robot looked totally different, uh, which was good, it forced, um, forced us to work on some stuff for software compatibility. In terms of software needs, we had uh, usually two onboard computers and a laptop on each of these robots, and then going to a cluster of, of around six offboard computers, um, sometimes up to 20, but usually about five or six. The idea was then we would incorporate lots of open source libraries, uh, which of course is good and, and bad, you know, it also brings in some complexity. But we wanted to have each of these sub-projects, whether it's the navigation system or the vision system, be able to treat the others as black boxes. So that you could, if you're working on manipulation, you could just assume that the navigation system would drive you to a location and it would work. Um, that, you know, as we all know, I think from running on big robot projects, that, that uh, is an assumption that tends to be violated oftentimes. And um, so then it's healthy then to, to force yourself to make these things work. Because of the large numbers of people and the sort of rotating crew of people working on this project, we were pushed hard for easy debugging, cross tolerance, and, and robustness in the system. So we came up with this idea for these early software frameworks um, where essentially there's a supervisory node which kind of sits at the top, has a list of connections that are desired between components. 
programs can launch, they register with the supervisor node, and the supervisor gives them a list of, of peers that they should kind of watch out for and sort of ping them periodically and connect to them. So when you do that, then you could take these little subprograms, you could launch them manually on Unix shells inside debuggers. Um, there could be daemons which start up and fire everybody off. Um, this is kind of where things started, and I think you can kind of see the beginnings of ROS in here. This wasn't fully developed at the time. The list of, of peers was static. It wasn't dynamic. It, uh, other problems occurred as well, but, but this is kind of the, the big picture idea starting to take form here. The idea of a computation graph is essentially, this is the graphical version of the text file that used to be contained uh, by that supervisory node. So instead of just a big XML file, you can actually plot them with the graph here, and you can see that if you make a graph, <coughs> the nodes, the circles in the graph are the programs, or Unix processes, the edges are data streams, which are connecting on the fly as things pop up. The, the insight and the usefulness for looking at this graph is to say that this is a sparse graph. And that's good. Um, the sparsity means that we can actually cut this graph up into several pieces, put them on different computers, and actually get a benefit to parallelism. If this graph was a super dense you know, spider web or rat's nest, then it would be difficult because everyone would just be waiting on everything else. But oftentimes in robotics, uh, these, there are kind of cliques or, or subgroups that are highly inter intercommunicating a lot, and then they're totally separate from others. Like a navigation system, you can imagine, has like five or ten programs. They talk to each other a lot, um, but they really don't talk very much to a computer vision system or to a manipulation system. The other thing that's nice is most of these links are low bandwidth, which means that uh, we can oftentimes fork, fork them apart and put part of it off the robot, part of it on the robot, or maybe not have a great connection between them, but you still get a benefit to, um, to, to splitting it up into parallelism. So we had this joke, kind of ongoing joke in this project of the fetch a stapler as like the ultimate problem in robotics. So, you know, you're sitting on your can there, you want to staple some papers, you don't, have, you don't have the papers with you, so you're like, robot, please fetch me a stapler, and then it just goes and tears off down the hall. Um, it's kind of an older navigation system um, they're running. It does a dance here to park in front of the door because the arm was teeny tiny at this point in the robot's life, so you had to like, get the robot in just the right space, could kind of reach out and actually be able to reach the door. Um, but the idea here is there's tons of programs running. Uh, they're all kind of sharing control of the robot. Everyone's running at the same time. There's three computers on the robot and I think three off the robot for this experiment. So then we kind of switched to this other navigation mode, which at the time could handle cluttered scenes better. And then now there's a computer vision system that is zooming the camera all over the place, zooming in and out, looking left and right, looking for the ultimate object, the stapler there. So you can see it's on the edge of the table, again, because of this, this goofy robot at the time had this little teeny arm. So you had to be you know, up and close. There we get it. We predict a grass point on there, grab it, pull it into the, um, the payload of the robot, and then drive back. Um, the point isn't necessarily that the stapler fetching problem is like the ultimate problem for mankind. It's rather that the idea of Integrating tons of subsystems onto a single robot causes you and forces you to, to learn interdependencies between systems. And uh, the idea of kind of this big picture of a complex robot doing complex tasks is, is sort of forces you to deal with them, I guess, when you're all running together. And of course, at the end of the day, you can sit there and then you can staple your papers. And that's just great. Okay, so what did we learn from STARE? The idea of doing this, of forcing the difficulties, these large demonstrations, was to learn some things. So one thing that came out of it is that multiprocessing is a great thing. Uh, this, you know, someone had this idea back in the 1960s as well. Turns out they were right. Um, virtual memory is a wonderful idea. Uh, it contains crashes when you try to segfault fault a program in, in you know, multiprocessing. It just takes that one program down, you core dump that guy, and the rest of the system stays up. Uh, it also helps you identify which component is the cause of the crash. Um, we, in our early, kind of early, early days, actually, before even the stuff I plotted here, it was, had a multi-threaded um, framework that I worked on. And the trick was that, is that oftentimes what would happen is one subsystem, like, so you have a vision system, they would run off the end of the image and go trash somebody else's memory, and then the other subsystem would then crash five minutes later. And it's often at times hard to tell, of course, when you unravel that, who was at fault at the beginning? Who was the first guy that walked off the end of his memory? Um, with with multiprocessing, virtual memory isolation, you, you don't have that problem. You actually do know like who went down, and that's great. Um, the second major point we learned is that reconnectable links help debugging. So that means that um, in, in the staircase, we had a static list of, of connections that were desired. In ROS, this is all dynamic, but anyway, regardless of that, if these data links between the peers can reinitiate themselves, then you can do lots of fun things. You can keep a large system up. So on the stair program right there, say we had for that, that stapler demo, we had about 30 programs running. If there's just one that you're actually hacking on that, that day, you can control C that guy, you know, change two lines of code, launch him again, and then he just connects back into the whole system and everything stays up. 
saves you tons of time from having to turn it off and on the entire system. Also, equally importantly, you can then run a, or a subset of those programs inside debuggers, whether it's Visual Studio or GDB or, or whatever. Um, and then when you want to, oftentimes in debuggers, of course, you'll hit a breakpoint, you'll modify a line of code, you want to recompile and rerun it, well, when you do that, you had to kill a process and start it again. So if the system can kind of reestablish itself without having to go all the way down, all the way back up, it saves tons of time. Okay, so what did we learn that was bad? Uh, we learned that external dependencies are a big deal. Um, I think like a lot of projects, we start off with uh, a giant shell script called install dependencies.sh. Uh, this is great when it's like five lines long. And then typically over time, the project grows. Um, more things are coming in. You have, oh, I just need to add a few more lines to take this package in. Then there's a new release of Ubuntu, so now you have a bunch of if blocks. Then someone wants to use Fedora, so you have another if block that contains that previous if block. It just goes on and on and on. And by the end of this, I think we had like 100 lines long uh, shell script that no one really knew how it worked anymore. Um, and it sort of worked on some platforms, and then it was just confusing. So the other thing is that it's tempting to rewrite functionality unless it's completely trivial for the authors and the users of subsystems to install all the dependencies. That means that if it requires more than like one shell command that's like 20 characters long, people don't do it. And it, eventually they'll say like, oh, I'd love to use OpenCV, but you know, that particular version doesn't compile on this weird Linux distribution I'm using, so all I really need to do is just increase the contrast of an image, so I'll just code it up, it's like five lines. And over the time, everyone does that, and everyone has basically coded up ports, parts of OpenCV that don't talk to each other and that are all kind of broken in various ways. So the idea is that dependencies are a big deal, um, and what's even bigger deal is they need to be really, 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 really easy to bring in. Otherwise, there's just too much friction and people don't do it. Okay, so another thing we learned, um, simultaneous development on a single repository just doesn't scale. Uh, maybe this is obvious for, for those of you who are experts in enterprise software development. I wasn't at the time. Um, the paradox here is we all want kind of the whole, everyone else to just like hold on for a minute while we work on our code as fast as possible. And of course the problem there is that serializing development instead of parallelizing it. So really um, what we need to do is, is have methods where each subsystem can be developed on their own, targeting a, a stable, um, stable versions of other subsystems and you kind of all just sort of decide, well, okay, it's time to move on to the next kind of clunk forward and, and everyone will move forward. Um, this problem, of course, not unique to robotics, but I think that uh, it's a big deal sort of as any, as any project, for any software project, starts, um, starts growing in size. Okay, so all the time we are doing the STAIR project, there's also this project called the Personal Robotics Program at Stanford. This was run by Eric Berger, Keenan Weirbeck, and Ken Salisbury. And they produced that robot there, which uh, you'll find looks mysteriously like a PR2, because um, it is. It's made out of wood and uh, fabric instead of metal, but that's okay. Um, let's see, so the idea that Eric had as the software designer for this is use tons and tons of tiny programs all talking through a central server. And what Eric works hard on is making these programs simple to write. So they're like, it's like a single console screen in VI, for example, is the whole program. The idea he had, which was great, is that the, the reflex when you wanna do a new feature should be to write a new little program, as opposed to adding you know, a couple more pages of code to an existing program. If you can make these things small enough and easy enough to iterate, then you can just crank them out. And when you want the robot to do you know, new task X, you can just make a new program that happens to be 20 or 30 lines long, as opposed to um, trying to add and, and sort of get these giant monolithic pieces of code. Eric also uh, was key in pushing for us to not wrap the main function. Um, I was tempted in my earlier frameworks, uh, I would like, write these giant macros, and so you'd, at the end of it, you just say like, run, in all caps with parentheses, you know, of course. And uh, no one ever really knew what was going on. And actually, I would kind of forget myself. But it would like, you know, expand the macros 20 ways and stringify everything. And, um, and that's just bad. That's just bad. So this, um, this idea of leaving main visible, it costs you a few lines of boilerplate. Um, but the idea is we should push hard to get that boilerplate down as opposed to hiding the main function and, and generating these things on the fly with preprocessors. At the same time we were doing all that, uh, there was a large famous open source robotics program called Player Stage, run by uh, the brilliant Brian Gerke right here. And Player's large, uh, at least for me, for my, my own just sort of development, I guess that the main thing it brought to me was that it's oftentimes more natural to think of connecting data streams instead of connecting Unix processes. That's kind of a sea change in thinking, because instead of like you have a, instead of thinking about, gee, this program's gonna start up, it has this particular port, I'm gonna connect it to that particular program, Instead you say, there's things called images in the world, and that we should publish them, and that other people can subscribe to images. It's great. Um, this is allows, allows us to be dynamic, which means that there can just be messages called laser scans flying around, and people who are interested in laser scans can subscribe to them. You don't have to know ahead of time who's gonna subscribe to them. It can be all on the fly and dynamic. 
the other great insight I had from, from Player is that the framework doesn't need to enforce a programming style, meaning that the framework, uh, or the, the message passing layer, so we say, doesn't need to say, well, you should code your robot in this particular way. People can do kind of whatever they want, um, and that's okay. Because really what we care about at the end of the day is messages that are flying around. And exactly how those messages are produced and consumed and processed is, is, uh, you know, is, up, is up to the person writing the code. So then this little list of goals, I guess, that we all kind of brought to the table was let's be flexible. Let's let people do kind of whatever they want. If they want to be highly formalized, that's great. They can do that. If they want to just um, be wild and crazy, they can do that too. Let's be thin, meaning don't wrap up main. Let's use as many libraries as possible. Let's try even to encourage folks to push functionality into libraries so you can have, for example, a command line version of a program or as well as a ROS node library of a program. You can also um, pull the library out and use it in someone else's robotics framework too. That's great. Multilingual, uh, I'm sort of a C, C++ person from way back. Um, what I've discovered is that people who write in Python get more done faster, so I'm trying to learn that. Um, Open source is a good thing. Um, it's tricky, though, to make sure that you can get people to all agree on that. And one way that that seems to work better is to use the BSD license, because that's sort of been known. Uh, there are companies such as Apple Computer who do great things with BSD licensed open source code. Um, so that's, that's why we want BSD, is to encourage commercial take on the thing and not have to worry about any kind of licensing difficulties at all, because BSD is, is known to be commercial safe, I guess. Okay, so that's kind of early days stuff. Now. I'll do kind of a whirlwind tour of what's going on in ROS. I, it's tricky in a group like this because I think there are lots of us here who have used ROS for a while. There are lots of us here also who are just getting into the system. So um, some of this will probably be too slow and some of it will be too fast for various parts of the community here, and that's okay. So here's a bunch of robots. Uh, they all run ROS. It's neat. Let's see. So architecturally, it's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system, which means that there are lots of small programs. We call them nodes if you put them on a, in a graphical sense. Um, there's a master program sitting on top, but that's really only a name service. Think of it like DNS, in that it's who you call when you want to find out who your peers are and where they live. So even though there is a master, everyone's connected to it, there's not actually a lot of bandwidth to the master at all. It really ends up being a bunch of, a bunch of queries, um, and it doesn't get hammered too bad. So the communication, the, the bulk of these data streams are over TCP or UDP uh, between Unix peer-to-peer -peer processes. So each process comes up, he launches a socket, and then the master tells them where to find these sockets, and then they start blasting data directly to each other. So a simple, uh, probably the simplest situation is pipelines, when you have one program feeds the next, feeds the next. Um, so in this little case, we have a camera driver node. It's talking over some magic peripheral bus to a, a camera, but that's okay. No one else needs to know exactly what peripheral bus or how that's happening, because at the end of the day, all it does is publish an image message, a stream of these things. So then there's another face recognition guy and all he does is take in images. It doesn't care where images come from. They can come from disk. They can come from live cameras. Um, really what it's doing is its own black box. It's, it's looking for faces and pictures. And then it outputs little data structures called faces, which maybe is a matrix or something. Um, those then feed a dialogue manager, just in this little example. It really doesn't care who's upstream of it or who's downstream. Really what it's trying to do is look for faces and, and think about, you know, did I see this person before? Should I talk to them? That outputs text strings in this example, which then go to speech synthesis. Again, the, the, the point of here is that each of these black boxes is isolated from the others, and it really doesn't matter. We could take them out of this particular pipeline and put them in a different pipeline, and that the hope is that these things are generic enough and that the, the flexibility there in the framework such that these are reusable. 